So I'm going to talk about why we need a why. And to set this up, um, imagine like when you're teaching a course, you typically start with the question what, and then you might ask yourself, you know, okay, so there's this body of content, and you think about how you're going to teach it. And then rarely we think about why we're doing it. Those of us in the room actually probably think about it a lot. And once you start thinking about it, you realize it should be flipped the other way around, and we should start with the why, and then get to the how, and then let the what's fall in place from there. That's more or less the arc of this talk. I want to start, though, with Seymour Pepper. He's, uh, I think he is very much kind of a grandfather of the movement in, that we're uh, part of today, in the sense that, uh, well, maybe a story will help. Like, if we go back to when Seymour Pepper was uh, in the, this is like the late, or early 90s, the web hasn't really blossomed yet, and he's sitting with a bunch of four-year-olds in a preschool because he's, int he's interested in how they learn. And one of them realizes that he's from Africa. They, they start asking, like, do you know how giraffes sleep? And he says, I can't remember how giraffes sleep. So that night, he goes home, and he's got this wall of books, and he starts rummaging through the books, and he still can't discover how giraffes sleep. So then he reflects on this while he's sitting there. He realizes, you know, it's not long from now we're going to have this thing. He called it the knowledge machine. And this knowledge machine would allow these little kids to use simple hand gestures and draw up any videos and pictures from all over the world and actually see how giraffes sleep. And of course, if you do that, you know, the knowledge machine is certainly here. And if you pull out your phone and you look for giraffes sleeping, you get like 56,000 hits on YouTube. <laughs> um, if that's not good enough for you, you can go to Google Scholar. You can get these very uh, in-depth articles about giraffes sleeping. Here it describes the paradoxical sleep, which was recognized by the peculiar positioning of the head on the croup. And if you don't know what the croup is, you can go to Google Images and still don't grab it. There it is. <laughs> so, so indeed, we can discover how giraffes sleep uh, with this knowledge machine. But Seymour Papert was very smart about this. He was not the type, and there were many, uh, who thought this was going to replace all of education, that this, you know, once you have knowledge freely available, it just happens. Uh, he was much more nuanced about it. He realized that while this is a knowledge machine in the hands of somebody who's curious and full of wonder and has a reason to explore it, it also can be a distraction device to those who don't have a reason. And that's why we need to focus so much on why. The second story, just to contrast this, is the story of Clayton Christensen and the narrative that he likes to tell about how he got drawn in to the idea of MOOCs. So he talks about you know, he's, being, he's at Harvard, and the, his first glimpse of what online education could be was when University of Phoenix came to him and said, you know, we'd like you to teach your business class. And he, at the time, he didn't really think much of online education. And he thought it could never disrupt higher ed. And he's not really impressed with the University of Phoenix either. And so he, his immediate response is, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to soil my name. I'm, I'm from Harvard. And they said, you know, you'll reach 150,000 students. And that gave him second thoughts. He thought about his core mission as a teacher was to reach as many people as possible. So he decided he was going to do it. So he goes to his dean, and his dean says, not on this campus. You're not going to soil the name of Harvard. So they end up renting out a space down on the water in Boston. And he shows up in the space, and he looks out in the audience, which is apparently full of University of Phoenix students, except that all of the students are incredibly beautiful. And he asks one of them, he says, are you guys actually students at the University of Phoenix? And he says, oh no, we're actors. Mm -hmm. And they're all there to act engaged and to, you know, and the, the basic idea was that, you know, you pan to, to Clayton Christensen and he gets confusing and then you pan out to the audience and you show somebody confused and then you show Clayton Christensen enlightening them and you come pan back to the audience and you see this beautiful face being enlightened and it draws the audience in and so on. Um, by the end of this, they also added all kinds of beautiful, you know, graphics in the background and so on. And at the end of this, he watches his own video and he thinks, wow, Clayton Christensen, you are a genius. You've never looked better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and this made him think, you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe online education could disrupt uh, higher ed. And he actually asked them, you know, he, he complimented the University of Phoenix on what they had done. And, and he said, this is really impressive. And, he, and they said, well, you know, we spend $200 million a year trying to improve teaching. And he thought back to how much Harvard is spending. And he thought, OK, this is, this is how it goes. Maybe this will happen. Um, but you know, there's something that to be brought out about this. And that is that 
this particular thing that Clayton Christensen is doing is a really good replacement for this. It actually is more engaging than this. But there are basic assumptions about learning that are here as well as here that we might not actually want to allow to define learning altogether. For example, it seems to define learning as the simple acquisition of information. Uh, specifically, it tend, the narrative tends to go towards useful information, which is to say useful in getting a job and so on. And we all know where that goes. This, uh, by the way, is my small class. This is my large class. Um, and then this goes back then to that basic storyline that I want to tell today, which is typically we focus on what, which is, in my case, if I'm teaching a big intro class, it's a lot of bold-faced terms like a monkey local residence patterns, ethnocentrism, cultural, uh, cultural relativism, and so on. Then we might think about how, then we get to the, hopefully we get to the why. But we very rarely even think about who. Now, this has some uh, certain impacts uh, at when we look at this other knowledge machine coming into the classroom. We find, you know, this is really the merging of two great knowledge machines, the university and then this knowledge machine that Seymour Papert talked about. And we see students Facebooking through their classes or, you know, bringing their laptop to class but not working on class stuff. So there's something, some kind of disconnect here. And some people have turned to this and for 20 years now have been set telling Seymour Papert, like, look, computers aren't going to change education and they're not really having a good impact. And he says, look, nothing could be more absurd than an experiment in which computers are placed in a classroom in which nothing else has changed. He says computers serve best when they allow everything to change. So Seymour Papert, in this regard, actually stood in opposition to Patrick Suffis. And they were both at the top of their field in the 60s as they were thinking about how computers could change education. But they had very different perspectives on this. Seymour Papert came from the angle of what he called constructionism. And he called Suffis an instructionist. So he had the constructionism versus the instructionism. Instruction, of course, is where you start with the what's, like, and you think about how to engineer the presentation of those what's to improve education. Whereas Seymour Papert is thinking about, he uses the phrase construction both to call attention to this idea of a constructivist model of learning, which is to say that uh, we are not just empty containers in which all the information just flows into, but we actually construct knowledge, uh, but also to draw attention to the idea that if you construct representations of your knowledge in the world, then it actually helps you learn faster and it allows you to collaborate with others, allows you to connect with others around you. So this idea of constructionism had many different layers to it and it ran against this idea of instruction. Now if you look at what was going on with Patrick Suffis, he, for example, developed this thing called Dial-A-Drill. Dial-A-Drill was basically a math training program and you could call in and you get a series of math pro uh, problems and you could do the math problems on your phone, and you can enter the answers and so on. Now what was interesting about this is actually it was very, very sophisticated. This was not just a simple thing. This was actually something, he had algorithms on the back end, so if you got a question wrong in the same way that other people got it wrong, it would kick back a little lesson for you to help you along. This was actually very sophisticated and not unlike what's happening at Khan Academy right now. So on Khan Academy, we know that you've got all kinds of student tracking on the back end, all kinds of different ways of modeling how students are learning. And their hope is that they can use this type of thing like they're doing at Coursera, where they can identify a cluster of people who are getting the same problem wrong in the same way, and then create basically uh, sort of adaptive uh, learning algorithms that allow people to learn better. And they have like, uh, here you can see Khan, uh, the Khan Academy has actually sort of mapped a good deal of what they think of as the body of human knowledge that they're trying to convey into a hierarchy, and your job is to kind of go through this hierarchy, uh, developing mastery along the way. As Seymour Papert would say, this is actually what he called the cathedral model of education, in which you basically become like an architect of trying to craft exactly what that body of knowledge looks like, and then trying to craft the different pathways through that knowledge. What Papert's main objection to this is, is he says, no matter how big your cathedral, how much you know, how, mu how many bits you put in there, you're only going to have about a billionth of, he actually uses the exact, this is his exact estimate, a billionth of the total knowledge in the world. And, the, and his complaint about this is, well, which billionth are you going to choose? 
his complaint about what's in general and focusing on what's in education is that there are too many what's, they're changing all the time, and they're insufficient. He says if you're going to take one billionth of all the what's, the one billionth you should take would be those that allow you to, are what he calls generative ideas. They allow you to get more knowledge, the knowledge that will help you get more knowledge. And more importantly, Papert was really uh, sensitive to the fact that your relationship to technology, your idea of learning, and your sense of self would actually ultimately shape just how well you can learn as well. So uh, so just to give you a sense of where, where I'm at in my, in my class and what this plays out like for me, when I first started teaching, I thought a lot about what? I mean, because that's what we all do. We all think that's what we're supposed to do. So I looked at all the bold-faced terms like avuncu local residence patterns and you know, cultural relativism, ethnocentrism, and so on. And I thought that's what I'm supposed to teach. And then I thought about how I'm going to teach it. I thought, I just thought about how to engage students as deeply as possible on these bold faced terms. So to give you an example of this, uh, this is participant observation, right? So this is that actual thing from my classroom. This is for you, Jim. You wanted me to do a little dance parkour. <laughs> so, so this is how I present participant observation. I take them to the field. This is my first night in the field in Papua New Guinea. And you can see it's a mess. There's people running all over the place. It's hard to really keep track. But there's clearly an interesting dance happening. And I point out that the only way to really understand it is actually to get involved. So you stand in front of a big screen, and I put my feathers in. And then I demonstrate that you know it looks like you're just jumping up and down, but you actually have to kind of pop it. No, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the punchline here is that, you know, participant observation is all about getting in there and shaking your tail feather and not being a wallflower and so on. So that's how I try to convey this information. But I do so with little attention to why. I think when I first started teaching, the why was simply, oh, it was, it was just like, it was the language of anthropology. And... Uh, I guess I had also realized that that language of anthropology, those ideas like cultural relativism and so on, had totally blown my mind apart and had me asking all kinds of questions that I never asked before. But uh, in terms of what it meant for who and how I understood my students, uh, mostly it was kind of in the negative because my students were not asking the same questions that I was. And I was disappointed in my students. I was frustrated with them. I found that the questions they were asking were not the big questions about who we are and where we're going, but questions like how many points is this worth, how long does this paper need to be, what do we need to know for this test. And so starting with the what's ended with a very bad conclusion about who my students are. Now it turns out uh, in the last few years I've gotten to know my students a lot better and they actually have much more interesting questions. Uh, this started actually when I... Uh, so I have kids now, and, and some of my students, I've been teaching for 10 years, so I had 6,000 students. And uh, I was at the park one day, and I met one of my students who had a kid the same age as my kids, so we started talking. And um, we started actually hanging out, our kids would hang out. And I came back one day, and, and she was like, oh, I called my friend who was also in your class, and it was the first class I'd ever taught. And, and, she, and she says, yeah, so I called my friend, and and she said, oh, is that, you? Is that that shake your tail feather guy? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what they remembered. And, and I thought, well, what's the real impact of my class? So I started really getting into this. And I've done, uh, you know, uh, a dance. little, yeah, more dance. <laughs> I've done a little over, uh, I'm up to nearly 100 hours in interviews with alumni now from my classes. And I also go to lunch every day with a student who's either in my class now or, or uh, has taken in the past. And here's what I've learned. While students are very, very diverse, there are three big questions that all students are asking. And those three questions are, who am I, what am I going to do, and am I going to make it? And just to flesh these out a little bit, um, an example of who am I would be this student. I just had lunch with her a couple uh, months ago. And she said that she came to the university and she, started, she came as a very devout Christian and she started to question her faith. And she leads all kinds of Christian groups and so on around campus. And she's actually now become an atheist. And, but she still leads all these Christian groups around campus because she can't bear to tell her, her parents that she's changed. And so now she doesn't, she's her, her, we're sitting there at lunch and she says, she says, I've been faking it so long I don't even know who I am anymore. That's what we mean by 
wondering who I am. Another student I met um, just recently, she, uh, her parents divorced when she was young, and then her mom started sleeping around a lot and would be gone late into the evenings, and eventually her mom just didn't come home. Um, she was 16, her mom stopped coming home, bills didn't get paid, she ended up uh, getting thrown out, she was homeless. She comes to school the next day after, after being evicted, and she's acting out in class, and her, her teacher takes her aside and is yelling at her, and she starts to cry, and she says, I can't go on anymore. And she goes home with that teacher that night. Um, she ended up being valedictorian, and she's now sitting in my class, and she's an accounting major. She's an accounting major because she thinks it's safe, it has a job attached to it, but she hates accounting. And she's wondering, what am I going to do? And then there's one final student I'll tell you about. Um, she's fantastic. She has everything going for her. She's involved all across campus. She's up for a Truman Scholarship. Uh, she's a, the best student you can imagine. She hands me a note at the end of class one day, and on the note it says, I know you think I'm a great student, but I need to let you know that, that I work so hard because my family is full of addiction, uh, suicide, and she made a, a long list of other issues. And she said, yet the harder I try, the more I feel like I'm recreating those very cycles that create all of those things. So she's wondering, am I going to make it? So these are the types of questions I hear over and over and over again from students. And it really started to recenter me and, and made me realize that there are bigger issues at stake when we're talking about our classes. So here I am teaching Avunky local residence patterns. And just as a quick quiz, Avunky local resident pa resident patterns are represented in bold in textbooks to designate significant learning or are safe ground upon which professors can demonstrate their conceptual <laughs> mastery. <laughs> Allow professors to avoid more difficult questions and more significant learning occur in 4% of the world's societies, or all of the above. <laughs> so, there's this great idea from Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, sorry about the typo there. He, uh, in 1929, he said, education with inert ideas, ideas that are simply memorized and not utilized, tested, or thrown into new combinations, is not only useless, it is above all harmful. Those who do so should be prosecuted for soul murder. So then we get to this question of why. Now there are, there are a lot of narratives out there about why, and there are three really big whys that you see that you can kind of piece out or, or flesh out from uh, any of the articles that you read, uh, policies and so on. One is the vocational why. Uh, usually this is put in the rhetoric of just get a job, but in the grander scheme of things, it's actually can be a very deep and meaningful uh, why, which is to answer those questions, who am I, what am I gonna do? Am I going to make it? Or you could look at it in terms of citizenship. This is another broad narrative where you know, this is about making a better world for all of us. The, we have higher education so that we can be better citizens. That is to answer those three sister questions of who are we, what are we going to do, are we going to make it? But then there's this other one, which is this how to enjoy life. This came about, uh, that phrase comes from uh, Andrew Del Banco, who is giving a talk at Columbia in this he was talking about the importance of vocation and citizenship and higher ed and, and liberal arts and so on. And this alumnus stands up and he says, he says, I think you missed the main point. And he says, what's that? And he says, liberal arts taught me how to enjoy life. There's another great phrase from that, which is uh, this idea of soul making, which is John Keats' phrase. Uh, Keats was dying young. He had tuberculosis in the 1800s, so he knew he was going to die. And while he was dying, he wondered what was my, you know, what was my short life all about? And he realized it must be about making a good soul. All the trials and tribulations create a soul. So I want to just quick, here's a, sorry, this got a little jitter here. Um, so now all this soul making and how to enjoy life, uh, this actually can funnel down into the most mundane moments. So as David Foster Wallace uh, speaking at Kenyon College, so magically reminded us, when we were standing in line at the grocery store, hungry after a long day, people talking loudly on cell phones, the, uh, a, you know, a woman checking out, having infinite coupons, and ends up writing a check, further delaying you, and you want to think, who are these people? He says, you have other options. Here's a quick uh, excerpt from that. But if you really learn how to think, how to pay attention, then you will know you have other options. 
It will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, hot, slow, consumer hell type situation as not only meaningful, but sacred. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things is important. Not that that mystical stuff's necessarily true. The only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see it. This, I submit, is the freedom of real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. That is real freedom. That is being educated and understanding how to think. The alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. So later in that speech, he notes that education is not really so much about knowledge as it is about awareness. Or as Joseph Conrad noted when asked, why do you write? Uh, he says, to make you hear, to make you feel. It is, before all, to make you see the glimpse of the truth for which you have forgotten to ask. So smaller whys among, uh, under these bigger whys of like, things like soul making might be things like critical thinking, creative thinking, empathy, storytelling. But all of these are actually much more than a set of skills. They are, at least a disp they are at least dispositions, if not total ways of being. They require a good deal of courage, self-awareness, and personal growth. People who study student development theory rarely find any true commitment or ongoing practice uh, of these capacities among students because students have a long way to go. Most students actually come in, just to summarize a large bit of literature over the last 40 years, they come in thinking that the world is full of answers and that their job is to acquire the answers. And they get frustrated with professors who pose questions and they see them just strictly as posed. Eventually they might realize that these, there are real controversies and their world starts to expand and they start to realize like, oh, there are difficult questions, but if only I had enough information or the right perspective, I could still get the answers. It's not until later that they start to realize that there's true ambiguity in the world. And most of the questions that actually matter actually are ambiguous and maybe don't have any answers. In fact, the answers to the best questions are usually just new questions. And so ultimately, our job comes largely here in, the higher, in, in higher education. It comes in allowing them to embrace ambiguity rather than slip back into a world of black and white, invite them into a world of wonder. So that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and there are, uh, I'll just mention here as well that in the literature, if you're interested in student development theory, you'll notice that each of these little white lines is actually a very critical moment which I call learning worth crying about because usually there is a massive transformation at that point where your whole worldview shifts. And if you think about what this means in terms of teaching, uh, this is from Neil Postman. He says, to become a different person because of something you have learned, to appropriate an insight, a concept, a vision, so that your world is altered, that is a different matter. He says, for that to happen, you need a reason. So then we're to, to us in this big question of why. So why your class? Why any class? Why your discipline? I took this really seriously uh, a little while ago. Now, we have these student learning outcomes. You probably think of these as administrative requirements, like I did. Um, but I decided to take it really seriously. First, as sort of a game, but then it became actually interesting. So anthropology is holistic. It involves critical estrangement, mapping processes by which social realities are realized, and so on. Now, but if you try to make student learning outcomes out of these things, you get some pretty interesting results. For example, you realize that in order to be holistic, students must be able to identify multiple dimensions, to connections and causalities, to, be criti to practice critical estrangements. They need to see beneath surfaces and beyond appearances while attempting to transcend biases and assumptions. None of this is obviously that easy. Mapping processes by which social realities are realized requires understanding how we co-construct the world. Uh, to understand context, we need to see the world big and small. We need to up identify, apply, and shift perspectives. Here's where it gets really interesting. Grounded theory requires us to sit in the immersive ambiguity and uncertainty of a messy problem for an unknowable length of time while slowly giving birth to a meager little insight, <laughs> treasure it for a moment, and then throw it away. Um, to be empathic, we have to imagine our way into another's perspective and embrace it, even if, or especially if, it is contrary to our own. And to be reflexive, we have to understand ourselves as culturally and temporally bounded entities mired in cultural biases and take it for granted assumptions that we can only attempt to transcend. These are actually the these are the true, authentic student learning outcomes that I would assess, uh, address for anthropology. But they're not 
exactly easy to uh, get to. Now in terms of like coming to your why, I think just a quick note about uh, digging into your discipline and thinking of the why of your discipline. Disciplines are actually full of inert ideas. Uh, so we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, if you're just teaching your discipline and not something more broadly relevant, uh, there can be some danger there. Um, as Whitehead warns, every intellectual revolution that has ever stirred humanity into greatness has been a passionate protest against inert ideas. Then, alas, it has proceeded by some educational scheme to bind humanity afresh with inert ideas of its own fashioning. So one option is to consider not, say, a list of student learning outcomes, but instead the animating questions of your discipline. So not the outputs, or not the facts, or even the paradigms, but those deeper questions that are often unspoken or even taboo thanks to the simple fact that they cannot be answered. And yet these are the most interesting. In anthropology, there are questions like, who are we, or why are we here? So for example, in anthropology, you might look at the world and you see that 1.3 billion people are living on less than a dollar a day, 3 billion on less than $2 a day, 800 million are undernourished, and 27,000 children will die of poverty today. And the big question then becomes why? And of course, you don't know the answer to that. And the beauty of such an animating question is precisely that, that you become a co-learner with your student. Uh, this is what's called, what Dewey called a genuine problem. It's a problem that you don't know the answer to and you don't know where it's going to go. Compare that to teaching avunculocal resonance patterns. Now, avunculocal resonance patterns is actually interesting in a way. If you look underneath it, what, a, what avunculocal resonance patterns is trying to do when you're teaching about avunculocal resonance patterns, you're trying to show that the culture that the student is in is like the water all around them. They're like the fish in the water, and the avunculocal resonance pattern is like the bait that you're trying to get them to leap out of the water and see a different world. But when you think about how you teach avunculocal resonance patterns versus how you teach the big questions, the big animating questions, avunculocal resonance pattern is taught mostly through this model, which is the old model of the object to be learned spread by the expert to the amateurs. And here we see instead uh, the alternative is when you become a co-knower among your students and you're all engaging with this living subject, this big question of why, this genuine problem. And all kinds of amazing things happen to the how when you have a why. Suddenly, for example, my whole classroom starts to dissolve into all kinds of uh, different things. We, start, uh, we started a Google Doc, for example. We decided to try to model the last 600 years of history and try to simulate uh, what's happened in the last 600 years so that we could understand the different major processes involved that create us as we are today. And that involved marshmallow guns, and it, it's hard to explain, but <laughs> there's a video online. <laughs> and, uh, but the real interesting thing about this is that it puts us all in a state of play. Instead of just simply memorizing what's been said, uh, we all become more playful. And play has a lot of great elements in terms of encouraging learning. For example, it uh, creates a sense of co-ownership, a sense of connection, a sense of trust. All of those things then create a platform on which people take chances. When they feel a sense of co-ownership, connection, and trust, they start taking chances. When they take chances, they increase novelty, which elevates engagement, which ultimately feeds back in and creates something of a virtuous cycle. So ultimately then, we're not disengaging from the what's when we talk about why. What still really matters. It's just that it's not a bunch of what's that you can fill in on bubbles on a Scantron. And it's not the, the what's where students are asking what's going to be on the test. The question is, what do we need to know for this test, this test of our lives? This works in virtually any discipline, I think. Frank Noches uh, has pointed out, for example, that Khan Academy has problems like this. This is a penguin on a sled, and if you, given the coefficient of friction and whatnot, if you pull the sled, at what speed can you pull the sled, at which point the, the penguin slides off the back? That's not what Dewey would call a genuine problem. It's not one that you're going to encounter in the real world, nor is it one that uh, you don't know the answer to as a teacher. You have all the information right there, and you can figure it out. Instead, he, Frank Noches, invites his students to a tug of war, and they can use any material they want on the bottoms of their shoes. They have to look up the coefficient of friction for those different materials and then decide which students of which weight will use which materials and so on. And then you can actually have a tug of war at the end to see who wins. Or their students are wondering about this video here. And the question is, is this fake? I guess, and again, there's all kinds of interesting math to apply to this to see whether or not Kobe Bryant actually did jump over a 
full of snakes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so here's uh, one final example, and that is this, this uh, energy that can come when you start with a why. So th this is a group of students I work with every year. We have this smaller group in which we simply have this simple why, which is let's create a great story. Let's construct something out in the world and share it with the world. Um, and we create a research schedule. You can see anybody can edit this at any time. Uh, we find that we have to read so much that we can't read it all individually. So we do collaborative readings on Etherpad. Uh, we break readings up. So th these are students who actually created assignments for themselves. Here a student has created a syllabus for herself for five weeks. She's assigned herself four books in five weeks. If I assign four books in five weeks, there's, you know, rebellion. Um, but here you see student after student assigning themselves four books in five weeks, four books in five weeks. As Nietzsche said, he who has a why can bear almost any how. And here we see an interesting uh, reflection on this. Um, this is a day I couldn't be in class, and the student says, we put a lot of good thoughts together in class. It was one of the sweetest class periods I think I've ever been a part of. No teacher. Um, so it's crazy, right? It was actually really sweet. We had the whiteboards cover spiderweb diagrams, list and connections and so on. Uh, my favorite part is down here at the bottom, though. She says, we're always being shaped, always learning. What is learning? I'm learning right now, processing, learning how to communicate my thoughts, typing speed increasing. When I talked to her later about this, she said this was like a major turning point for her where she stopped simply trying to be a good student and she became a real learner. So I want to end with some thoughts about what connected courses could be all about. And that is, I'll start off by just mentioning that most people will look at connected courses and they'll think they're kind of mooky. And I want to point out that Mookie is actually Mook with a Y. Did you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> and that might not be such a bad place to start. Because um, if we're animated, if you're animated by the what, by what you're supposed to teach, you're going to be constrained by the model of learning that that entails, which is to say just how to deliver that content. But if instead we're animated by a why, then suddenly the hows become wide open. And I, th I see people around the room who have been animated by whys for many years, and I've watched the hows just generate, just constantly new, new ways of doing things are constantly being generated by turning back to, the, to the, that core question of, of why. And I'll just uh, set uh, an aspiration here. I want to invite you guys, if you're interested, there's a, it's a long video, I can't really show it in, in uh, here, but there's an eight minute video we just created as part of my digital ethnography class. It's called To Live in This World. Uh, if you could watch it sometime while you're here and just reflect on maybe that would be like an aspiration for what a connected course could be uh, in terms of how connected the students felt uh, to the work and to each other. As it, watch it to the end. Uh, there's some surprises in the uh, credits. <laughs> and just I'll let that sit as kind of like a vision or an aspiration for what connected courses could be. Thanks.